Uh, welcome. Today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. I'm Steve Shields, president of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. Thank you for joining us. We welcome friends and members who are attending in person here in Seoul, and also those of you who are with us through Zoom. I express our sincere gratitude to the Asia Development Foundation for their continued sponsorship of our society. We also appreciate our many other donors, big or small, your support is important. Tomorrow is March 1st. We commemorate the 104th anniversary of the Declaration of Korean Independence and the struggle of countless thousands against the oppression of the colonial powers. Many of RAS Korea's founders and members worked on behalf of the sovereignty of Korea, some vocally, some quietly. Homer Hulbert, who had been unceremoniously deported from Korea by the Japanese authorities, who was living in Massachusetts, was tireless in his writing and promotion of a free Korea. James Scarth Gale, who lived right next door to this building, uh, under the oppressors until his retirement in the late 1920s, continued his mission of education and literacy, and under pen names wrote hundreds of newspaper columns advocating for Korea in the Times of London, the South China Morning Post, the North China Morning Post, the New York Times, and other periodicals. We also remember the Reverend Dr. Samuel Moffat, who as president of Sungshil University in Pyongyang, fended off a squad of Japanese soldiers who were ready to fire into the gathered students in the forecourt of the school. They had torn down the Japanese flag and raised the tegukki, and he preserved that flag, and it was in his personal possession when he died and was later repatriated to Korea by his sons, all of whom became missionaries and pastors and educators like their father. There were so many others who worked tirelessly, tirelessly and many lost their lives in the fight for independence. Uh, join me now for a moment of silence in their memory. Thank you. We're joined tonight by Hank Morris. He's the RAS Korea financial officer. He's going to talk about the rise of Korean asset management, uh, the sector of asset management, which in his view is a second miracle on the Han. Uh, Hank has had a long career in the Korean securities and asset management sector, uh, primarily with British uh, companies. Uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, he was head of the British Merchant Bank Kleinwart Benson's office here in Seoul. And uh, during that period uh, was also the head manager of the US $100 million Korea Pacific Trust uh, on behalf of the uh, Korea Investment Trust Company. Yeah, we, we issued it. I wasn't the man. Oh. We, we issued that. Okay. All right. Well, okay. You issued that. Uh, well, why don't you tell us more about it? I won't try and bore, bore everybody with uh, erroneous information. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, long career in, uh, in that sector and uh, brings lots of experience and knowledge uh, of the history to us. Uh, you are cordially reminded that the lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinions or positions of the Royal Asiatic Society Korea. After the lecture, there will be time for questions and answers. So let's now welcome Hank to the podium. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> good evening. It's nice to be back uh, to speak at the RAS. Um, last time I spoke, it was on the um, rather unpleasant subject uh, of the IMF uh, crisis. And um, this is an entirely more, I think, um, joyous almost uh, sort of subject because 
the reason I call it a miracle <clears throat> is that if I was on the receiving end of a mm. lecture 50 years ago from someone who was telling me <clears throat> that 50 years from that point, uh, individual Korean investors would have the equivalent of hundreds of billions of dollars in investments, and that Korean institutional investors would have the equivalent of uh, trillions of dollars in investments, I would have probably laughed. Uh, it would have seemed <clears throat> very bizarre in uh, 1973 <clears throat> had someone told me that. Uh, and so I, I think the, the, the miracle is genuine uh, because when Korea began, investment. <clears throat> there was an investment company organized in 1968 called um, the Korea Investment Corporation. And subsequently, that company, of course, uh, transformed its uh, name into Daehan Investment Trust Company. And uh, today is a unit of the HANA UBS uh, it's called UBS HANA Asset Management and is considered a part of the HANA Banking Group. So it's, um, it's considered the pioneer because in 1968, remember that the Korean securities sector at that point consisted of a stock market that had launched officially in 1956. So it was only 12 years old at the time. There were very few securities available for investment in Korea in those days. Uh, in 1968, the World Bank and the Asia Development Bank had been encouraging Korea to expand its stock market and to list more companies. <clears throat> so some of the companies that we know today as the great Chabol names, names like Samsung Electronics, um, LG Electronics, um, Hyundai Motors, uh, uh, so companies of that uh, nature were being listed in the stock exchange, uh, but there were relatively small numbers of them in the late 1960s into the early 70s. Uh, and of course, individual investors in Korea had no experience uh, of investing in shares. The, most Koreans even today have probably not bought shares directly. And so the nice thing about organizing a company like uh, the Daehan Investment Trust, as it subsequently became, uh, was that you could leave the driving, so to speak, you could leave the investing to investment professionals. You as the investor were purchasing units uh, in, in funds managed by DITC, and then in 1974, another um, asset management company was organized, and that was called Korea Investment Trust Company. Uh, and they were the early market leaders in Korea. So if you had some money, and if you were an investor and thought, I could do better than just invest my money into savings deposits at Korean banks, why don't I buy some Korean shares? Well, then the question would be, but what shares? You know, how would you know which ones would be the shares that might appreciate in value and make a good return for you? Well, if you were to buy a unit trust managed by Daehan or Korea Investment Trust Company, then you didn't have to worry on that score. The Investment Trust Management Company um, would handle that for you. And then, of course, as we got into the 1980s, we had a tremendous expansion in the scale of the Korean stock market. So we had hundreds of companies that were being listed in the stock exchange and a great expansion in the bond uh, listings as well. So the securities market in Korea is the stock market on the one hand that uh, we think of as the exchange where shares are bought and sold. And on the other hand, it's also a place where bonds 
are bought and sold. And the nice thing about the DITC and the Korean Investment Trust Company, the KITC, was that uh, if Korean investors didn't want to take a chance on the fluctuations and values that share prices involve, and they didn't want to buy shares, DITC and KITC had another product. They had bond funds. And the nice thing about the bond funds was it was very helpful for the Korean government at the time. The Korean government was issuing um, a steady stream of government bonds to finance Korea's industrial development that was in fact creating the miracle on the Han as we usually think of it as the great industrialization of Korea that occurred from the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Uh, so that was tremendously capital consumptive. It required huge investment. And the Korean government wished to help Korean industry. Uh, and so it sought means of funding such investment. Now, it did so partially through the deposits that Korean people made uh, or gave to the banks. Um, so many Koreans would remember from that era, they saved money. They were encouraged to save money in the banks, and they got a fixed interest return on their investment accounts. Same principle works all over the world. Well, the other alternative to having a savings account at a bank was to buy a trust fund from DITC or KITC that was based on uh, bonds. So the underlying securities in the fund were uh, fixed income securities issued generally by the Korean government initially in the early years. And then later, some of the Korean uh, companies got to the stage where they were very successful uh, and they were able to issue bonds uh, under their own names. And the DITC and KITC would buy tranches of those bonds and put them in their funds. And generally speaking, <clears throat> the Korean um, bond funds would yield just a bit more than having money uh, in a savings a time deposit account for one or two or three years. So if the time deposit account was going to give you a return of 9%, if you bought a bond fund, fund from uh, DITC or KITC, maybe you would get 9.7% return over the one year period. So it was a good value for uh, the investors. Um, and um, the, the success can be seen from the start point in 1968, when the very first funds were subscribed with very small amounts of money involved uh, to the level today where HANA UBS has 12 billion in trust funds, uh, the equivalent of US 12 billion, that's about 17 trillion won, um, and, uh, and um, Korea Investment Trust, which today is called um, True um, Friend uh, KIM, Korea Investment Management. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so that is how individual investors in Korea uh, were able to participate in the rise of the stock market. Now, of course, individual investors routinely buy and sell shares directly. But even today, there is a very good market for investors who would rather have professionals at KITC, DITC, or any one of uh, 150 or 200 other Korean and foreign asset management companies that are active in the Korean market managing collectively over the equivalent of $600 billion. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a very robust market. It's a market that um, employs thousands of, uh, of professionals in the uh, unit trust management companies. Uh, and of course, the unit trust funds are, are often sold through banks and sold through securities companies. So <clears throat> there are a great many people involved in the uh, management and the sale and distribution of the funds designed for the individual investor. 
Uh, <clears throat> but then, of course, the other great sector of Korean investment that um, I would like to talk a bit about is the institutional side. And one of the most important one of those is, of course, the one that just about everybody in Korea has a stake in, and that's the National Pension Service. Uh, <clears throat> now, the National Pension Fund is one of the largest funds in the world. Uh, it dates from 1988, when the first subscriptions were started. <clears throat> and uh, it really isn't voluntary. If one works for a Korean company, then one is enrolled. If you work for a government entity, you are enrolled. And the way it, it has worked since inception is that the, the individual uh, <clears throat> enrollee, uh, the future pensioner, uh, pays in at the rate of 9% of salary uh, every pay period. And that's matched by the employer paying in likewise the 9%. Uh, individuals who are self-employed, so um, operators of uh, their own businesses, uh, also participate in the NPS, but their contribution rate uh, is, is higher. Uh, correspondingly, I think it's around 14%, but I'm not positive. Anyway, um, <clears throat> currently, as you see, um, the 483 trillion won is the latest uh, figure that's readily available from the NPS website. Uh, and that does make the NPS uh, one of the world's largest funds. It is, however, somewhat controversial because like such national pension funds in other countries, there are constant concerns that the demographics are not in favor uh, of the solvency of the fund. And as a recent headline, which I clipped from the Chosen Ilbo, indicates that by the year 2055, this says uh, that uh, <clears throat> there will be a kolkab, a deficiency um, uh, in the fund. And that's a simple mathematical calculation based on the number of people who contribute versus the number of people who receive the pension payments plus the return earned uh, by the pension fund management. Now, the pension fund <clears throat> is managed by professional managers, uh, but it is, again, slightly controversial in that at times the fund has come under pressure to be a national champion so that when um, in the stock market, for example, some uh, Korean companies uh, that are uh, owned uh, that where the pension fund has a large ownership uh, and in some of the major Korean companies, the national pension fund may own 14 to 15% of total shares outstanding, which would put the fund uh, among the largest uh, owners of these companies. And these are the, uh, the 100 biggest names in the Korea stock market. So all of those familiar names that you know so well, um, <clears throat> the National Pension Fund has a major uh, stake in those companies. And at times the pension fund has come under pressure from particularly the Chabel families to support uh, their uh, <clears throat> plans for company development, uh, which might involve a vote of the general uh, general shareholders meeting and a vote. Uh, <clears throat> and it's often been expected that the um, that the Korean uh, Chabel families would look to the NPS to um, back their management position as opposed to alternatives that might have been put up by other shareholders, including foreign shareholders in some cases. <clears throat> so it's a bit uh, controversial. Uh, the other controversy, I suppose I could say, <clears throat> is that 
the fund is not managed and sold. Most of the professionals who work at the NPS are not resident uh, in Seoul during the weekdays. Mm -hmm. They have to go down to Chunju because the NPS is managed in Chunju. So that's a two hour train ride and then a half hour um, car ride or taxi ride uh, to the NPS's offices in Chunju. So as I understand that most of the staff go down on uh, Sunday evening or possibly very early on Monday and they stay Monday through Thursday at NPS arranged um, boarding facilities, generally are apartments that the NPS has uh, rented. And then they come back to Seoul to stay with their families on Thursdays, uh, I'm sorry, on Fridays through Sunday. So they spend the weekends in Seoul. Um, I think on that basis, it's, it's not the easiest thing to persuade uh, experienced financial professionals to take up a role in managing money at the NPS. And that might be one of the reasons why the NPS has had some, some difficulties in achieving <clears throat> desirable returns on investments in recent years. And this doesn't seem to be working. Okay. Um, Are you trying to change slides? I was trying to make it go up, but it doesn't seem to. There we go. Right. All right. Very good. Um, yeah. Okay. So just to show you what sort of things that the um, NPS invests in with your money, because it is yours after all. Um, alternatives, as far as I can see, are mainly real estate investments by the NPS, but they also include um, things like um, private equity investment. Uh, fixed income is just another word for bonds. Uh, and then equities, uh, of course, means shares, stocks and companies. Now, the thing about the NPS is that not all of these investments are in Korea. Uh, probably about 65% uh, or so of the NPS's total fund is invested in Korea. The other 35% is invested around the world. So you'd find NPS investment in the USA, in Australia, in Canada, in the UK, um, in France and EU countries, um, and probably in places like South Africa, uh, Brazil, India, so, and of course, China. So you would, you would find um, a great deal of the portfolio is actually not invested in, in Korea. Uh, <clears throat> and that of course means that in order to have a global portfolio, the NPS does need to have investment professionals who are familiar with international markets, not just the fixed income and uh, equities markets of uh, of Korea. Right. Um, <clears throat> so yes, the total uh, under management, again, all this comes from the website uh, of the NPS. Uh, at 900 trillion, 920 trillion, this ranks the NPS fund as easily in the top five funds internationally in the world in scale terms. So it is enormous. Uh, <clears throat> but you see that the global equities is um, a good deal, about double the size uh, of the domestic equities. The fact is that the NPS uh, you know, owns 14 or 15 percent of just about every significant listed Korean company. And if they were to invest in any more, then you could get conflicts of interest where uh, the management of the company would, would want to have someone from the NPS uh, at participating in board meetings and management meetings on a, on a routine basis. Um, 
because that scale of investment would warrant that type of participation in the company's management. But the NPS is what we call a passive investor. It does not seek to, to control the company management. Um, <clears throat> so in any case, um, the, uh, the fund uh, sectors are um, diverse in terms of location, domestic and global, and also in the type of investments. Uh, so that's what the uh, professional investment managers would, would do. Um, and we're having trouble again. Point the uh, thing towards the computer. Uh, right from the okay. Um, I think it, it worked. Now, the next um, institution that I'd like to, uh, to discuss, of course, is the KIC. The Korea Investment Corporation. This is Korea's sovereign wealth fund. It differs from the NPS in that it's it's younger. It was set up in 2005, um, <clears throat> but it has a, a legal mandate um, set up by the Korean um, National Assembly, passed by uh, a law passed uh, that uh, precludes the KIC from investing inside Korea. In other words, the law states that all of the KIC portfolio investment has to be outside Korea. Nothing can be inside Korea. Uh, the KIC is managed here in Seoul over at the State Tower building um, near Myungdong. Um, it, um, initially began with just 20, just, I mean, that, that's a large amount of money, actually, $20 billion, 17 came from the Bank of Korea, and 3 billion came from the Ministry of Finance. Um, so it, it is supervised, um, of course, by the uh, Finance Committee of the National Assembly, but also by um, the Bank of Korea, because uh, the bulk of the investment that the KIC began with uh, in investment portfolio terms was contributed by the Bank of Korea. Subsequently, there's been another tranche um, that the BOK gave to KIC to invest. And I think altogether, um, the BOK contributions probably around $30 billion. But um, in, in any case, the, uh, the total of the original capital that KIC had to invest, that 20 billion, uh, plus that additional tranche that the BOK subsequently uh, consigned to KIC, uh, plus KIC's returns on investment uh, have taken the, the total up to uh, $205 billion uh, by 2021. And that comes from the KIC website. And that is the most recent information that they have publicly uh, released. Uh, so uh, they do have uh, a respectable record, I would say, in, in terms of the return that they achieved. Um, uh, certainly the um, return <laughs> over 9%, um, uh, or even the after fee return of nearly 9%, uh, is a, a very creditable uh, return on investment by uh, any professional, reasonable professional standard. Um, so um, the, um, the KIC's portfolio, uh, again, entirely overseas, uh, is in foreign stocks, 40, a little over 40%, in foreign bonds. Now, the bonds would be a combination of sovereign bonds. That would be like US Treasuries, uh, British uh, gilt-edged uh, bonds. Um, Euro bonds issued by uh, Eurobank um, and 
uh, top grade uh, corporate bonds. Uh, so they might buy a uh, a bond of uh, General Motors uh, or uh, Boeing or uh, Rolls Royce or something of that kind. Uh, and then, of course, they do need to keep some um, cash. Uh, hybrid securities, uh, I believe, is uh, their term for uh, things like convertible bonds that uh, can be exchanged into shares. So it, it's a bit of a hybrid. And then uh, they have a strong commitment to private equity. Uh, they do have uh, a real estate portfolio. Uh, and they do invest in, in hedge funds to a, um, a modest extent. Um, and uh, right, so I think that's um, the only other very large scale investments in Korea on an institutional basis is by the insurance industry in Korea. So you have the non-life companies and the life companies. And as near as I can see, they collectively manage the equivalent of probably about uh, six or seven hundred billion dollars. Uh, so that's quite substantial. Um, and uh, that uh, is, of course, strictly regulated. Uh, the insurance uh, sector, after all, has to have funds available to pay out the claims. If someone dies, then the family and the survivors are entitled to the uh, benefit claim. And uh, likewise, if a house burns down or there's a building fire, uh, then the owners receive the compensation accordingly. So the, uh, the Ministry of Finance has established uh, prudential regulations that are relatively strict and do not let insurance companies uh, invest willy-nilly in, um, in, in a wide range of things. So typically they invest in fixed income securities that are often Korean government uh, bonds and the bonds of major Korean companies, but also major foreign companies um, and foreign uh, government securities. Uh, and then one last large pool of institutional investment funds that exists in Korea is of course the reserve account of the Bank of Korea. And that's about, I think 450 or $60 billion, something right in there. Uh, and uh, so that's a very uh, healthy balance. I think most economists would probably agree uh, because the idea is that a country, if it wishes to be on the careful side, would normally have um, about six months uh, in reserves uh, of funds available uh, if there was an emergency and they had to import at the uh, at whatever the current rate is. And in Korea's case, I think imports are running at maybe 50 billion US roughly uh, a month. So if Korea has 300 billion or so in the Bank of Korea reserve account, that would be considered a healthy balance. But in fact, it, it has a good deal more than that. And it's something uh, well in excess of uh, $400 billion. Um, and then, of course, the KIC 200 billion uh, can also be used at any point that uh, there is national interest. Uh, there is no end point for the KIC. The obvious endpoint for the NPS is when someone retires, they are then re entitled to their uh, retirement benefits. But the KIC is, is meant simply to build up long-term wealth for Korea <laughs> as a nation. That is the objective. Um, and um, so I think I've mentioned uh, individual investments, the unit trust fund sector, um, and how that began. Um, and then uh, the discussion of the NPS uh, and the KIC, the two largest pools of uh, funds that are um, managed in, in Korea, um, in addition to the 
Bank of Korea, and of course the insurance sector. And that caps it. And so if you look at the totals of all of these funds under management in Korea, I think you'll get something around two to two and a half trillion dollars uh, in, in amount under management. And that's actually greater than the annual GDP of the country, of, of Korea as a country. So it's a pretty remarkable achievement. I think it's miraculous <clears throat> to have gone from uh, essentially the zero point in the 1960s with virtually nothing under management uh, to today's levels where you know, Korea has considerable amounts of, uh, of wealth um, in national accounts, uh, but also in individual and corporate accounts. Uh, so it is a, a miraculous and um, a very impressive achievement that everyone in Korea can be proud of. And on that note, thank you. Okay, I'm going to let you field your own questions. I don't need to oh, okay. your So can I have the mics on, please? And uh, please just raise your hand. I'll let him call on you. If you're online and have a question, type it in the chat box for us and we'll circulate around to have Joanne read that uh, when there's a question. Okay, may I ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for your big time, uh, Hank. Your first name is Hank. Yes. Well, honestly, I'm not expert in this area, although I have long been engaged in international training for the Right. And uh, just a basic two questions. Uh, very impressive, very encouraging uh, presentation. Well, first question is, I mean, every city like Hong Kong, Singapore, or Shanghai, like Busan, Incheon, Busan is going to even the first building of mega financial town, Incheon. Yes. But what's the relevance and what's the importance of every city you know, claim they are, we are hub, international financial hub. Well, these days, you know, I don't know how much that kind of impact is that given in the digital age, it well, is digital banking. Yeah. So this kind of institutional finance market has something to do with the really, you know, kind of financial hub. Well, that's, that's a first question. That's a good question. Second question is my, uh, one of my you know, nephews is working for American trust company. I cannot tell which company. Right. But I think that, you know, regarding NPC's you know, management fund, you know, trust, the American trust banks are monopolized almost like with SK, of course, they are very competitive. Mm -hmm. What is the competitive Korean trust company? This is the second question. Yeah, that's a good question too. Yeah. All right. Well, on the first one about the, uh, the, the physical nature of financial centers, uh, and sometimes we call them financial hubs, yeah, right. um, I, I think it's mainly a matter of personal convenience, honestly. Um, in a place like Hong Kong, uh, you have a, a number of things that come together to make life easy for people to do financial businesses. You, you have a place where the professional people all speak English right. to a high standard. Um, you have essentially English law. So the financial system of Hong Kong still operates uh, in, essentially in, uh, under English law. <clears throat> Um, now we know there's been some problems in Beijing we'll, politically. We'll that, we'll yeah, that. but I'm I'm talking about in terms of financial mm -hmm. securities, securities law. That's, That's English law in Hong Kong. Um, if you went to Singapore, you'd okay. also find that Singapore law uh -huh. is based on English law as well, oh, really? from their time as a colony of the yeah, United. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, in Japan, it's different, of course. Um, but uh, I couldn't actually say that Japan is a financial hub 
I mean, it's a financial center for Japan. Yes, like Seoul is a financial center for, for Korea. It's the biggest, because this is where um, most of the financial companies have their headquarters. Most mm -hmm. people that work in finance wish to work here. They don't want to work in Chunju. They don't want to work in Pusan. Mm -hmm. And they won't want to work in Incheon either. Okay. okay. Uh, I can be quite sure. But it doesn't matter for us. But yeah. so do you think Seoul is Seoul or whether or not it's Pusan or Incheon? I don't care. But yeah. Does, really Korea is doing is really qualified to become a giant hub in the Asian market? I don't think Korea is going to have a great deal of appeal. Uh, as far as foreigners wishing to come in and do financial business here, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there are uh, too many difficulties. The Korean won is not fully uh, tradable. It's not fully open to international trading. In Japan, the yen is. In Hong Kong, the Hong Kong dollar is fully tradable. In Singapore, the Singapore dollar is fully tradable. Of course, in England, the pound sterling is fully tradable. What are we talking about? It's not. But um, the appeal about Shanghai is that China has designated it uh, to be their most important financial center. Mm -hmm. So most of the important Chinese banks and Chinese financial companies, asset management companies, the investment companies, the insurance companies, they all have major uh, offices in Shanghai. And so that's given it the importance that it has. Mm -hmm. But you know, people who want to uh, do things in the financial sector elsewhere in Asia, I don't think they would tend to base themselves in Shanghai. Unlikely. Trust the bank. Unlikely. Yeah. Trust the bank. Yeah. So we can trust the bank. Well, the the question of competitiveness. Well, look, I mean, if if you're talking about, you know, who knows the Korean market better, a large American trust uh, like a state bank, state. Uh, like a, yeah, whatever the name might be, whether it be Fidelity or State Street or any of them, do they know the Korean market better than the Korean trust companies? I doubt it. You know, I sure. don't think so. Probably. So if the objective is to invest inside Korea, mm -hmm then I think the track record of some of the Korean asset management companies is excellent. Um, some of them have been managing money for a long time. They have staff, um, they have many staff members who are very experienced in managing uh, Korean equities, Korean bond funds, and they have a very, very good track record. I don't think the foreign companies have anything better to offer in Korea. Now, if you talk about global. on the global side, yeah. yeah, I would, I would be likely to uh, to to say that uh, I'm not sure that any Korean investment company would have any advantage mm -hmm. in investing in UK stocks right. over. Uh, a British investment company like Schroeder's. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that Schroeder's or even an American asset management company like Morgan Stanley Asset Management would probably have more expertise in managing UK stocks mm -hmm. or UK bonds mm -hmm. than say uh, Shinhan um, uh, Asset Management um, or um, any of the Korean asset management companies. Fair, thanks, Dawn. Yeah, let me just follow up on that question. I mean, uh, the, the gaping black hole in the, this, this otherwise impressive picture is the Korean stock market, yes. which is, I think last year was the worst performing stock market in the top 20. And over the last 40 years, it's, it's, it, there's just been no, no significant. Well, well, there has been in the last forty years because I was I was active in the market in the nineteen eighties, and they were very okay. exciting days then. There's the chart. Unfortunately, yes, yes. Um, yeah, this is, compared to the size of the Korean economy and the excellence of Korean companies, the market is massively undervalued, massively underperformed. Koreans won't well, invest in it. Foreigners can't invest in it because it's not in Morgan Stanley Capital Index. Well, is there any hope for the Korean stock market or is this more well, expensive to be discounted? 
Um, well, uh, there's a lot of questions there. I, I think the future for the stock market. Well, the, 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 the future will be brighter when the Korean government opens the wand to full. Can, can, can I tell you something? Fungible. Since you so ill came to power, I've asked in press conferences, Governor of the Bank of Korea, Minister of Finance, will you ever allow the wand to be fully tradable so you can join the Morgan Stanley Index? Their response was. They refuse to answer the question. Mm -hmm. Both of them. Yeah, well, it's, <clears throat> it, of course, the Ministry of Finance has historically uh, been highly conservative on the question of opening the currency to trading. The fear being, of course, that Koreans will take their money, change it into yen or dollars, and flee the country. So that would leave Korea without funds, operating funds that uh, would need, because foreigners would not, they think, would not come in and spend money here. Uh, I think the fears are uh, increasingly uh, unlikely, uh, improbable. So I, I think foreigners do hope that the Korean government will make the one fully fungible fully open to international trading. Uh, I think it would be good for the economy. Uh, I think it would bring in new investment. And I think it would help to reduce the uh, so-called Korea discount where Korean securities, uh, equities uh, are not um, appraised at the level that we might expect for an economy of this scale. Um, but that's also got uh, to do with the problem of the table management um, and the opacity uh, of the chables. So I think as long as the, the chable families are um, unwilling to hand over management uh, to professional managers or uh, to uh, make, um, their management uh, style more open to analysis, uh, the, the lack of openness will also have a bearing on the valuation of the equities. So in other words, it's a dire future. Um, Jebob's not changing and you're not um, the SCI. Not going to change right away. It's going to be a while. I would say. Any online right, question? Yeah. We have two questions from Michael. So uh, then, thanks for the presentation. And question one, uh, given the IMF and the uh, 2008 financial crisis, what do Korean funds do to avoid repeating those mistakes? Right. And question two, one of the slides showed the National Pension Fund running a low uh, around uh, 2057. So what is the government doing to ensure uh, viability? Well, those are two good questions. Uh, when the IMF uh, occurred, it was discovered that a lot of the unit trust funds had been sold without any uh, offering memorandum given to the individual investors. So they in effect, we're told by the salesman what was in the fund, what securities were in the fund, and the investors purchased the fund with essentially no information. Uh, that would not happen in a developed market like the UK or the US, where regulation requires that a, a information pamphlet, which we call an offering memorandum or sometimes a prospectus, must be given to the investor so they can read what their investment will involve before they actually pay the money and make the investment. Um, so that prudential regulation was instituted uh, in Korea. And today, if you go into a bank or a securities company office in Korea, and you look at the brochure to buy the let's just call it the uh, the ABC Global Equities Fund. Uh, they will give you probably about a 50-page or 60-page 
uh, offering memorandum that describes in great detail all of the uh, possible outcomes, the risks involved in investing in that type of fund so that the investor has a, a really good grasp of what is involved and what the dangers are. Uh, and so it, the prudential regulation that's in effect and has been in effect for the last 20 some years uh, is a very positive outcome of the uh, IMF uh, crisis of 97, 98. Uh, in 2008, Korea actually didn't lose much in the global financial crisis because um, at that stage, uh, the institutional investors were not investing huge amounts in international securities uh, and individual investors were also not investing uh, great amounts. And here in Korea, there was no mortgage securities crisis so in, in fact, in the 2008 period, there was not much damage done to um, either uh, Korean institutional or individual investors. Um, so that was fortunate. What was the second question? Uh, one of the mm -hmm. slides shows the national pension fund running low. Oh, yes. Around the viability. Yes, the viability. Well, of course, that is a political question. And the way to uh, ensure that the National Pension Fund um, will not uh, run out of money to pay the pensions that come due, uh, well, there's two things. Number one, they could increase the individual contributions from the current 9% to, say, 11% and correspondingly increase the company or the organizational contribution likewise to 11%. Um, and they could also uh, hope to uh, increase the yield on investment. Uh, the NPS has had some difficulties and suffered some losses on the investment side. So they could seek to improve their investment returns. And I suppose the third thing is they could adjust the age at which investments can be, uh, can uh, the uh, pensioners can begin to collect. Uh, I think currently it's about 60. Possibly they could push that up to 63 or 64. So there's a number of things that could be done to um, ensure that the pension doesn't <laughs> run out of money. Any other questions? If not, let's get back to another round of. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Man. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't uh, stop Mark being in China. <laughs> but, um, but I just wonder if some individual investors think that the short selling has some negative effect on. Um, yeah, it is controversial. Yeah, the, the Kong Medo in Korean. Um, is controversial. Um, the thing is, uh, if if you sell a security short, you are betting that it will go down in price. So, um, and and then the idea is that you rebuy, you you purchase, and then you repay the loan that you took to sell the security. Um, so, if the security is valued at one hundred uh, now. You sell it, you get the hundred, and then if it um, falls to seventy, um, you buy it and repay the loan, and you you've got a, a gain of thirty, you know, less the transaction cost. So that's the idea. Uh, but of course, the the problem for company managements is that when they see short selling, they take it personally, because. The short seller is basically saying, company management is doing a bad job. This company should be doing better. It's not. And because it's not, I think the share price is going to fall. So I'm, I'm going to sell short. And no company management wants to see that. It's, it's always going to be unpopular. Uh, wherever short selling happens is never popular with companies. Um, 
On the other hand, it's, it can be seen as disciplining um, companies. So if a company is confronted by short selling, it then has to scratch its head and uh, the management has to consider, well, you know, why did that happen? Um, are we doing something we, we shouldn't be doing or should we be doing something else in a better way that we improve the performance of our company? Um, and then instead of short selling, people will buy, they'll come in on the buy side. But regardless, every short sale is ultimately a buy because at some point, the short seller must buy the security and close the loan out. So eventually the short selling does end. It's a question of how much short selling takes place in a relatively uh, short period of time that could um, influence things uh, negatively. Sometimes it could be um, a case where the short sellers are ganging up on a uh, particular share and circulating false rumors. And then the, the management really is good, hasn't done anything wrong and are performing well, the company's doing well, but false rumors are being circulated that, oh, they're doing this wrong, they're doing that wrong. And so the short sellers are trying to deliberately push the share price down so they can make money on their short selling. Can happen. Um, probably doesn't happen very often now. I think it's a very risky strategy. Um, so yeah, a little bit controversial, but on the whole, I think um, that short selling is a part of modern uh, markets and to try and stop it is probably not wise. Some people say that the total size of the Korean market is very small, like a little tip that has. Yeah, but is it, I mean, you know, we have, we have a market, but well, I think that's hard to justify because the scale of the Korean stock market is roughly the size of the GDP. So that's not small, really. I mean, it's it's a pretty sizable market. I mean, like um, Mr. Salmon just said, it could could be larger. It probably should be larger. But um, even so, uh, <clears throat> in considering all the difficulties of the pandemic and everything, uh, the Korean stock market is is pretty sizable, um, pretty significant in scale. 